The following transmission contains unencrypted instances of explicit language. Shall we begin? Let's begin. This week on Spies Like Us, we are headed back to the 70s to discuss a Francis Ford Coppola movie starring Gene Hackman. This film is more of a character study than an outright spy movie, but it is certainly pertinent to our exploration of spy cinema as it explores the stress and paranoia that can come with the job of surveillance. I'm Todd, and with me as always is Dave, and we like to talk about spy movies in general and specifically to discuss and diagnose the tradecraft that's on display. This episode, 1974's The Conversation. I'm going to imagine that, although I'm sure you've heard of the show, that like the Laverne and Shirley show wasn't like a, a part of your TV watching growing up. I think I'm, when the big Naked Night stuff was going on when I was a kid, I probably brushed past it, but I've, no, I, I didn't watch a lot of it. Definitely was not a part of my growing up. <laughs> sure. Did you know that the, the lady, Anne, in this movie is uh, Shirley from from that show. I did not. Wait, right. that's uh, definitely a good catch. I think this. I think this comes out. This is a let's see, 1974 film. I I think so. I think this is before even Happy Days. Is this like maybe her start? Was this like what, what maybe got her discovered? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see a lot of 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 roles for her. Yeah, I think I think she's just getting started at, at this oh, point. Okay. Just off the off the cuff, I wanted to mention about Happy Days. Something just just personal because I'm born in '71. I think that show comes out like in the mid mid '70s. So I'm definitely watching it growing up. My parents liked it a lot. And the thing is, I was old enough to know to understand that it was a show about the '50s, mm-hmm. but nobody. Nobody told me that it wasn't made in the 50s. And I didn't know that for actually a really long time. And it totally skewed my perception of what television looked like in different eras. Like, uh-huh. like basically, basically, I grew up thinking everything that was made in the 70s was made in the 50s. And that everything that was made in the 60s was made in the 40s and everything that was made and actually made in the 50s was like made in like 1930 or some shit like that. (laughs) That's pretty funny. It's amazing what like childhood, because you don't really understand quite a bit. You just kind of soak stuff up. And and so you kind of have like these uh, baselines that you don't even really, like I, I, I had a huge crush on Shirley Temple when I was a kid. And then I realized how old she was. Oh, like, you know, like, sure, sure. right. <laughs> there's so much that you, like the gravity doesn't really hit you till you get older. Like, you know, <laughs> so I know how you feel. We're here to talk about the conversation made in 1974. Featured agencies are uh, a bunch of independent contract surveillance experts. And that includes our protagonist, Harry Call, played by Gene Hackman. And an unnamed corporation that clearly has access. I don't know if their in- intelligence operations are all internal or if they're contracting out to some other people other than Harry Call, but they clearly have some kind of access to some very complex and shady intelligence related resources. The movie comes out to crit- critical acclaim, but box office disappointment. The movie was this anyway. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, that's it's a it's a good question because we've stumbled into a, you know, this is this this is a tough one. This, I mean, I, it is a spy movie. It's just I would say so. It's just an artsy one. Right. It's an artsy spy. <laughs> it's more of like a character sketch with like a a sort of variation on the film noir plot. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. Right. Like if if for instance. Anne had been the one that hired Call in the first place, then it would almost perfectly fit a film noir plot formula, I think. Right. But yeah, we'll we'll get 
We'll get more into that as we go. Francis Ford Coppola wrote, produced, and directed. I primarily just know him from Apocalypse Now and and Godfather. This, by the way, comes after Godfather. It's the first film he makes after Godfather. Is it? Does this come after Godfather One or Godfather? It, just after the first one. It's oh, his I first see. movie after the big Godfather was like the big, huge, massive hit for him. I also found out something I, I didn't know. He also directed another movie that I really like, Patton, but which came out before hey, this. Yeah. yeah I didn't know that. Me neither. Me neither. It's cool, that speech, though. The, the big speech with Patton is really famous in film history. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't know that was Coppola. Oh, yeah, sure. The entire film, I think, is is really great. Godfather's always been a weird one for me. But let's see. I think, so I what? Uh, let's see. Here's here's how it went. I think I went around telling people I hadn't seen Godfather. And then I sat down and watched it. And as I was watching it, I was like, wait a second. Like about a third of the way through the film, I was like, wait a second. I think I have seen this. I just didn't find it especially memorable. Oh. <laughs> and then it gets weirder. About two thirds of the way through the film, I say, and this was just like last Christmas, about two thirds of the way through the film, I say, wait a second. I think not only have I seen this before, I think I've seen it twice before. And the second time that I saw it, I had the same experience that I was having (laughs) now during the third experience of seeing it of, oh, wait. I have seen this before. I just didn't find it especially memorable. <laughs> Did you have like a family guy moment when they're in the panic room and he's like, I didn't like the Godfather. It insists upon itself. Is, is that kind of like a <laughs> moment that you had? <laughs> sort of. Nobody gave me crap about it. And I didn't, I definitely didn't say I didn't like it. It was just weird. I just couldn't remember it. Um, oh, wow. Okay. But, yeah. but I think I'm on top of it now. What about you? Any other Coppola movies you can name? No, but I really enjoyed Apocalypse. That's probably one of my favorite war movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is super on that. high on super high on my list. Yeah, and, and I remember in high school, uh, we were reading, like, literature. It was, like, reading comprehension or whatever, and we read, like, a short story in it, and Nate were, told us that was what Apocalypse Now was adapted from, and I was really excited. It was like Heart of Darkness or something. Uh-huh. And so I went and watched Apocalypse Now, and I was like, oh my god, this is really good. You know? So I, I, I that's how I f- like got into Apocalypse Now, because it came out way before I was born, and then I was in high school, and that's when I started getting into watching films, so that's, that's how I found out about it, and I was like pretty blown away. Yeah, definitely one of my favorite of of all time, and one that really, really makes me understand why Coppola has such a reputation in film. His his whole list of films that he's directed is not especially long. I think there's like seven or eight, really, excepting like short films and stuff. But funny, funny to me is to find out he's still active. He's got plans to just actually just a couple months ago in August, it was announced that he plans to direct a, a project of his called Megalopolis, which he's wanted to do for a very long time. And he actually is aiming to try to start uh, filming it next year. Well, is the, is the anime a story about the reconstruction of New York City after a mega disaster? No, but I think that's similar concept. Oh, really? It, there was, I mean, it wasn't in New York, but maybe I'm tripping. That would be interesting to follow up on. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look that up. Yeah, he wanted, he, that, was a, that was a film that basically got, like, put deep, deep, deep down into the shit can when 9-11 happened. I guess, I guess that was around the time that he was first starting to, to work on it oh. and get the ball rolling on it. And he had to wait, like, 20 years before. <laughs> and then everybody was like, nope. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's that's Coppola for me. This film, I I don't I don't feel is I don't know. 
it's it's not worth a best director award or anything or even a nomination. I I don't think it's even worth recommending. Yeah, um, me, me I think even. not to skip too really, far to the end, but uh, <laughs> we, we didn't really we didn't really like this movie. No, I I was excited to do it because when we did Enemy of the State, you brought up that it's been discussed that it was a possible like an unofficial kind of half-ass sequel to like well not half-ass making call it yeah call it a like a spiritual sequel i think is what you would call it and 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 so i was like oh wow that's a great cool we should do it on the show and i kept bringing it up to todd and we had other stuff that we wanted to do and timing wise and then bun comes out you know we never got to it but now that like i was like oh let's finally do it and then i watched the film and i'm like what is happening What's going on? Like, what is going on in this movie? And so I kind of feel bad, but not really. I'm, I'm glad we did it, but I, I don't think Todd nor I would recommend this film to anybody. No, cannot, cannot, cannot recommend. Although you know, a lot of weighty film critics, you know, say it's really great. It's just, it's just not my cup of tea by a, a comfortable mile and a half. Right. I would say. <laughs> um, I mean, like. Yeah, I, I like weird stuff. I like artsy stuff, but I feel like whatever Coppola was trying to accomplish, he didn't accomplish. And I, I definitely don't think Enemy of the State is a spiritual sequel. It, the only connection is that the, they kind of look similar because it's Gene Hackman that plays both characters and they're both into tech. So that's that's like the extent of what you're going to get out of considering this a sequel. Well, they're both into tech. They're They're both very knowledgeable on surveillance the enemy of the state character is the kind of supremely paranoid character about protecting his privacy that you would expect harry call to have become right after the events of this movie they're both kind of a recluse right right and uh, you know they they both have that uh, like i don't know brown coat with the raincoat Uh, on it which almost has to have been like uh, an intentional homage to this film right when they put it in there and there's also like you know people have mentioned that they both have like an iron cage in their secret lair kind of situation actually when i was writing notes oh and they're also i mean they're also it's not it's an iron cage in a warehouse right yeah i actually wasn't sure what to call that thing like I was like, oh, it's kind of like a lab. Well, it's not really a lab. It's like, what is it? Like a man cave? No, not re- yeah. I don't know. We'll just we'll just call it his secret hideout. Yeah. Um, well, it's not so secret. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's not not as secret as I would like it to be. Yeah, uh, for sure. Gene Hackman, love him, hate him. What's your what's your take on the hacks? Oh, I love I, I love Gene Hackman. He's a great actor. I think he did great in this film. I just don't think he had a particularly a lot to to let him shine. But I mean, I, anytime I've seen Gene Hackman, I've always enjoyed him. Yeah, I'm I'm I was you know I obviously think he's fucking fantastic in The Unforgiven. I think he's hilarious as Lex Luthor. I like. I like everything I've seen him in. And especially I was kind of surprised uh, when I got to see the French connection, which is a movie that we might do on this podcast someday. It's a little, little fringy whether or not we can really stick it in and, and call it worthy to be talked about on this podcast. But seeing like a young Gene Hackman as like a fucking badass, like was (laughs) kind of, kind of cool for me. For us. He's a repeat because of Enemy of the State. Well, it, wasn't he in uh, No Way Out? He's also in... Oh, he's a three-peat. All right. Yeah, he's cool. a three-peat, yeah. Hey. Do we have any other repeats here? We haven't seen Bobby. We haven't seen Harrison Ford, but he might. He will probably repeat on this podcast someday for uh, Clear yeah. and Present Danger or something like that. Oh, that's right. We definitely have to do that. That's a great film. I forgot about that. Yeah. No, I don't think we have anybody else. No, yeah, not not as of not as of right now. Some fun stuff I dug up on Gene Hackman. I want to mention here. I found out he was a Marine. Oh wow! Um, interesting. 
I like this. Him and Dustin Hoffman became friends, really good friends in 1956 at uh, like the Pasadena Playhouse, which is where they both first started getting interested in acting. And the two were kind of, I don't know, they kind of formed their own clique of two. It was kind of <laughs> away from the rest of the class and they were voted least likely to succeed. Wow. Uh, Hack, Hackman got the lowest score the Pasadena Playhouse had ever given as what? an actor. <laughs> I guess he showed them, right? <laughs> right. Well, determined to prove them wrong, he moved to New York City, where, along with Hoffman, and him and Hoffman, and then that's where they hooked up with Robert Duvall. And they kind of all, like, because they're all California born, but uh, living in New York, and they kind of, various two person combinations sharing apartments and and doing uh, acting stuffs together right last bit of trivia on hackman he was all set to accept the role of mike brady for the tv series the brady bunch and his agent had to talk him out of it wow really <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a very different brady bunch I guess I, I, I watched one episode and I said this, I, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's see. We talked about Cindy and then we got Harrison. He's Harrison Ford. Right. I was, I was excited. I think this is, I, yeah, this has got to be my first and only pre Han Solo Harrison Ford film that I've seen. I liked him in it just fine. Yeah, he was good. I think Harrison Ford gets underrated as an actor by a lot of people personally. And oh, I would agree. Yeah. I okay. think a lot of people just think of him as on solo, but I, I like, I've seen all, like, you know, I mean, there's the fugitive and we mentioned clear and present danger earlier. He has plenty of stuff that I, I think most people that only know him as Han solo really missed yeah i think like one thing that i like to bring up in in that conversation is that i think han solo and indiana jones on paper just looking at the script could easily have like a lesser actor could have played those characters exactly the same way but in the way that harrison ford does them they come off as totally different characters, but you see what I mean? Like, like on paper, there's almost no difference between them. Oh, between Han Solo and yeah, absolutely. Right. And throw out uh, a couple of lesser known Ford performances of, for movies that I do recommend to people. And these are movies where I know that his acting did get some, some really good positive critical notice are uh, witness you ever heard of oh, that one? Oh, that's yeah, that's the Amish one. I yeah. Can't, yeah, I saw that movie like twice as a kid. I remember the murder really freaked me out as a kid. Yeah, and then one of the kids was a witness, and he ends up joining the Amish community. Yeah, that's a great movie. I right. can't, I always forget about that one because I remember it used to be on TV a lot when I was a kid. And then also, uh, I was a big fan of the Mosquito Coast. Oh, I don't think I know that one. That one is kind of a. Let's see. God, I had a, it's, it's a little heart of darknessy, but, but, but not quite. It's a guy I mean, a TV show. What's that? There's a TV show out. Oh, really? That they made that just came out this year. I would definitely um, like to check that out. Cause I like the movie enough that I, I bought the book and read it as well. I read it several times. It's about a guy that. It, it basically, he's got this whole master plan to take his family off the grid and go live in the rainforest. Uh -huh. And, you know, because he's an inventor and basically he's invented like a, a, a means of refrigeration that doesn't require electricity. Uh -huh. And so on the basis of that, he's going to go just form this like enclave in the rainforest and be as far away from civilization as possible but still like be able to maintain like kind of modern somewhat, somewhat of a modern lifestyle. And it all goes wow. very horribly wrong. Right. Uh, oh, Helen Mirren's in it. Oh. Is she? Yeah. It's been a long time since I saw that one. On River Phoenix. Yes. Wow. He plays the sun. Yeah, that's right. This is a pretty solid cast. 
Right. So both of those movies are like examples and I can't think of others, but these are like such perfect examples to me of like, I don't know if you can think of any examples from your life, but this is basically like me, little Todd loves Han Solo, loves Indiana Jones, a Harrison Ford movie comes out. I'm like, I'm buying a ticket, you know, like, (laughs) (laughs) even though like, it's not a science fiction film, you know, which is all I really cared about when I was right. a kid was like science fiction and adventure and stuff. And well, it kind of is with the refrigeration, I guess you could kind of maybe sort of say it's like, eh. <laughs> what I'm, <laughs> what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is these are examples of like when you, when as a kid, like you just like follow an actor into this entire other, more adult genre that you hadn't ever been exposed to. Like witness, oh, okay. witness was a real like mind blower for me seeing that i think i just saw it alone in the theater i just told my mom i wanted to go she said okay here here's a ticket here's a bus pass whatever and then watching it i remember thinking like wow i'm watching a much more adult movie than i've ever considered before but it like really broadened my you know that and mosquito coast they both like broadened my perspective these are movies i never would have seen unless you know i had just had this like fascination with like fuck dude han solo is cool i'll watch anything that's got han solo in it <laughs> <laughs> right robert duvall is in this one actually out of this entire cast robert duvall is the highest in my personal esteem i love bobby love me some bobby did you ever watch lonely dove lonesome dove oh lonesome Do- my dad yeah i watched a little bit my dad I was a huge Western fan, and he liked Lonesome Dove. And I think for Christmas, I got him a whole Lonesome Dove set. Cool. And I watched a little bit with him. But yes, no, no, uh, I do remember that. Cool. Yeah. I am not a big Western fan. I will absolutely <laughs> go to bat for Lonesome Dove. It's fucking great. And then there's, we got a little connections here, too, with Coppola. Robert Duvall had already made THX. 1138 that's george lucas's first film which i'm pretty sure you haven't seen no i have i have not seen that thx 1138 is one of my favorite movies that i can't recommend to anyone i think if you ever see it you will you will probably very quickly say oh my god yes this is a Todd movie <laughs> and I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know who else it's for but it's absolutely for me but, but Coppola produced that. Oh, wow. And Duvall had, of course, also appeared in The Godfather and also shows up in perhaps his most remembered role. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> so clearly him and Coppola feel like they see eye to eye on stuff. Terry Gar, I really even after I found out it was Terry Gar rewatching, I mean she's got a very small role in this film, right? She's the girlfriend. Even after finding oh. out that was Terry Gar, yeah. I still struggled kind of to see Terry Gar in her. Uh, right, maybe because right. she's just so young or uh. something. And this is this comes out uh, Young Frankenstein though is what's going to make her like blow up right uh and that's a movie that comes out just just later in the same year 1974 conversation at young frankenstein same year little odd i thought especially how small of a role she's got she's she's billed above harrison ford which doesn't make any sense to me yeah that's really interesting yeah, it doesn't. I even checked. I even thought to check, like, if it made sense alphabetically, and it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. She was in it for like just as long as he was, and he had a much bigger impact on screen. I get well, whatever. Yeah, sure. She was good. I, I mean, not to say she wasn't good. I, I liked her. You know, I thought everybody was a good actor. I just don't think they were given anything great to work with. You know what I mean? It, there was so much about this film that really bothered me. And I felt like it wasn't fair to the actors because everybody played their part pretty well. Well, do you want to, do you want to pause and talk about it now? Or do you want to save that for the, 
for the oh, star no, rating say, at the end. I'll, I can say that for the star rating. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll go. I'll go either way. Um, no, 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 I'd rather save that for the star rating. It's just, it's still stuck in my head after watching this movie. I'm still like confused. So yeah, no, let's talk about it at the star rating. <laughs> I'll just say right now, maybe like, like part of it is like, it's a very moody film where no, no two characters seem to have anything like a relationship with each other or a a connection with each other. And if that's part of the point of the film, because it is a very alienating film, it's definitely interested in a sense of alienation, but I don't know. At some at some point, I I got I need a little something more to grab onto. Maybe. Yeah. Last note. So I'd also been excited when you know, gearing up to do this cast to find out that uh, Billy D. Williams is in it. But on further investigation, doing the notes, this is the the note. I'm going to quote it from IMDb. Who's the more? Oh, now by the way, he's listed in IMDb as. Man in yellow hat, uncredited. Okay. (laughs) Here's someone's comment on that. Who's the moron that submitted his name to IMDb as a credit on this movie? Seriously, it looks nothing like him, and Billy D. Williams was already playing bigger roles prior to this movie. This is why just anyone shouldn't be allowed to submit information to the site. I hope the offender reads this. You're an idiot. (laughs) So he's not in it. (laughs) Or it's a mystery. <laughs> there is a guy. He's in. He's he's a guy in the in the crowd when Hackman is recording the conversation between Anne and Mark. Uh-huh. There is a black guy. He's in a yellow hat. I think he has a line, but I think he's just generally talking to the crowd. Just you know, character. It's not a. It's not like you know any piece of dialogue. Or anything. And yeah, I don't really think it looks like Billy D. Williams. I had to bring it up because I did mention in our Facebook posts that Billy D. Williams was in this film. It looks like he's definitely not. This guy looks, I'm pulling it up right now. This looks nothing like him. Right. (laughs) So. I think we'd have to ask Billy D. Williams if he was in the conversation himself can't trust everything you read on the internet breaking news no. breaking news from the spies like this <laughs> podcast there is an element to this film that i think is absolutely stellar and that is the sound and the music the 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 con the eponymous conversation which we see recorded at the beginning of the film was intentionally recorded with different takes from the actors to help the editing of the movie to showcase his interpretations of their meaning as it evolves over time. <clears throat> so like a really interesting one is there's uh there's one point in the movie where call is listening to it and he hears Mark say he'd kill us if he had the chance <clears throat> later in the film, he's listening to it and it comes out as he'd kill us if he had the chance. Right, which I think was brilliant. I, I like that too. Just all of the, all of the, you know, this conversation, really just all the sound in the movie. I didn't get a chance, I guess, to see if it was, uh, oh no, it was. It was nominated for best sound. I'm not surprised. The sound in this movie was fucking fantastic. The way, yeah. you know, conversations were layered in Harry Call's head, this whole thing about like him being an unreliable, you know, he's trying to, piece it together figure it out so they intentionally make it sound different at different Mm -hmm. times based on like what he thinks is going on that's really cool yeah Um, there's a lot of really good piano in it but earthquake was was the winner i guess i guess somebody made the earthquake sound really cool (laughs) okay right i'm I'm almost, I'm almost not lazy enough to start making this list. Spy movies where it's set at Christmas, but only barely. Like, blink and you could miss that it's Christmas. Right. That's true of Red. Uh Uh-huh. It's true of, what was the Robert Redford film we did? Uh, Three Doors of the Condor. 
Three Days of the Condor set at Christmas. Yeah, just but just barely. This is another one. It's 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 at Christmas, but Christmas doesn't intrude into the film. Yeah, but, it's uh, not part of the theme or story. But I did like hiding the recording devices in the Christmas present. Because during Christmas, people are walking around with presents all the time. And if you have this big bulky recording equipment like they did back then, having a giant box with recording equipment would make sense. I like I like just wanted to point that out. Let's go ahead and give it some plus spy points. Yeah. Before we head into the briefing room and uh, start looking at some more places where we liked or disliked the tradecraft on display in this film. Retinal scan complete. Validating security clearance. Clearance granted. You may now enter the briefing room. The the recording that he does of this conversation in the in the town square. This is set in San Francisco. It's it's a big, super crowded, super complicated shot. I love that. You can give some some credit to the director for that. These these kind of these kind of scenes can be really really difficult to set up. You know, when one person one extra in the background fucks up, and you have to reset everything. Yeah, I liked seeing you know that what he's getting four points of recording from them right mm -hmm. he's got a directional mic he's got people set to stand close to them at first i was wondering i was kind of hoping that the mime was on his team right yeah i totally thought the mime was on the team yeah <laughs> because the mime's whole job is to like you know kind of follow you around and and like woo 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 and <laughs> act kind of clever and and make you giggle or something and like if yeah. he was if he was recording i thought that would that would that would maybe top to my list right <laughs> but but uh, yeah but then again you know i've i've seen surveillance before and it uh, you know the technical aspects of surveillance in this movie are pretty spot on they're just a little bit boring and uninspired i think <laughs> that's why I don't get super excited about them. But this is sold to us, and I'm a buyer, that this is a pretty elaborate, you know, difficult to, to set up surveillance operation, which yeah. gives rise to me to the question, why? Like, why is it so important to record these people at this time and kind of never find out that's uh something that really bothered me as well um you know i i guess we'll talk a little bit about it now the, the whole plan of the, the surveillance was to catch these two in an affair I, I i feel like they didn't need to get this recording to prove that you know what i mean if if this had been like some kind of terrorist plot and somehow this recording is the most important recording. I, I, I could see the awe behind the difficulty of pulling off this recording off, but I feel like we don't get told why it's important to record this conversation. We just get told how cool it is that Harry pulled it off. You know, you know what I mean? I'm with you. It seems like, okay, so like A, there should be like a lot of much easier ways to get recordings of them in private also let's see the director should have told harry what information he's looking for you know i mean we we're never privy to the scene where he hires him but even you know it it kind of would have gone in my mind usually like one of these scenes where like harry says well i'll take the job but i need to know what i'm looking for and the director says well I can't tell you that it's, it's personal. Mm -hmm. And Harry call would say, well, you have to understand, you know, I have to explain to you before I take this job that I really can't do this job unless I know what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise it's just going to be insanely expensive mm -hmm. and I'll just have to surveil and catch everything, which apparently he didn't though. All he has that we know of is this conversation if he was so if he knew that he was looking for evidence in a, of an affair or if he didn't either way he should be looking in a lot other places than just this 
Yeah. Like this one conversation shouldn't just be his sole source of these are the tapes to give to the director. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I completely agree. And also, if he doesn't know what he's looking for, then how does he know when to say, okay, I got it. And if, huh. Also, how did they like, know that this conversation was going to happen also? That's something that kind of bothered me a little bit. The only way that would make sense to me is if, like, Harry had started to surveil them and realized that they're being insanely careful, you know, like really, really, really careful, and that there's no way to catch them in any kind of phone conversation or meeting or anything and that you're just really going to have to put like, you know, a four man team on them 24 fucking seven. But yeah, there's no indication if he had had some indication that this conversation, that this moment in time, you know, they're going to be planning something was important. We don't get that. And I really, I really don't like that. And it's, it's part of, it's part of my number one worst tradecraft of the film. Just the, the plot in the background doesn't make sense to me. Right. Um, yeah. You know, starting with the plot doesn't make a lot of sense. It kind of bleeds out into a lot of other things that don't make sense. So yeah, let's just jump into the plot. Oh, why don't, why don't you explain it to me? Um, I got questions. Do you want me to give away the twist? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Start, start from the beginning. What's, what's okay. really, what's really going on here? So in Mark and Martin, we think, is trying is plotting to kill the director, who's played by Robert Duvall. They know, well, I guess Anne is married to, to the director, and there's some sp suspicion that they've been having an affair. And Harrison Ford, I guess, is in on it as well and is trying to convince the director that they're having an affair. So the three of them have plotted... Uh, this idea to catch the director, like, I guess, on his heels and get him out of the picture so they could secede to the throne or something, you know, so to speak. But they're, they're so aware that the director is into surveilling people and is very jealous and very suspicious of people. They basically planned out this whole conversation and planted the idea that they're going to go meet at a hotel so that they, that Harrison Ford, who's just pretending to be suspicious, hires Harry, who's like the best like tech spook uh, recorder surveillance guy in the world to get this recording. And they, they think like, you know, I actually liked the, the, the whole conversation where they're walking in a circle. I thought the couple did a good job being aware that they're probably being watched you know, and that, you know, the fucking song, the Red Red Robin song is like, just got stuck in my head. But they, they, they made, they played the part of pretending that they thought that they might be being recorded and that they're playing mm -hmm. it safe. So by, by really trying hard to hide the fact that they're going to meet at a hotel on this day and time, it looks very authentic to the director that they are in an affair, which is what the plan is. Like, and that 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 is the basic plot is that they're going to kill the director so that they could take over the company and who's the wife is probably going to take over the company and i guess she's pals with mark and martin and they have like a whole plan to like i don't know we don't we're not told the motivation for this but that's the plan and they set up this whole conversation and planted the idea so the director would come in his rage of jealousy and then they could kill him but like we discussed, it's still unclear to me why they need Harry Call. And this actually made my worst number two tradecraft. If you're Harrison Ford, you I mean, we haven't gotten there, but he's already established as a very capable surveillance guy himself. And he seems even better than Harry at trailing people. And Harry's just really good tech at like getting conversations. At this point in the movie, we don't know that. But you and I have, have mentioned that. Like, right, ex that's, exactly. that's, that's something that bugs us a lot. Like by the end of the movie, it feels like, you know, the, the company has such great access to lots of great surveillance tracking. I mean, they seem so much more advanced than Harry. What do they need him for? Right. He, he, 
I think specifically the movie wants us to believe that catching this conversation on tape is impossible without Harry's expertise versus Harrison Ford is really good at tailing people and looking them up or something. Sure. I, that's my whole point and why this made my worst tradecraft. If you're trying to prove that Anna and Mark are having an affair, you don't need a, a recording like this. You could just trail them, get pictures of them, like meeting up secretly and, and get like, and, and even still, like you could make, you could find, t- there's so many different ways to pull this off. They don't need Harry. This, that's what I'm saying. This is just about proving that there's an affair. And so the, it, that's why it's my worst trade craft. Sure. Let me, uh, let me take a stab at this. See if I can, if I can navigate it through. Martin lets Anne know like, Hey, he's hired a guy to, to catch you guys in the act. And then they all sit down they say, what are we going to do about this? And they say, ah, I got a genius plan. We'll walk around talking about a certain meeting that we're going to have, which will sound like a, you know, a romantic tryst, you know, something Mm -hmm. tempting, some bait on the hook for the director to show up and catch us in the act in a jealous rage. And then we'll kill him. Wow, that part doesn't make sense either. Just fucking kill yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> just ki- just kill him. Skip this entire movie and just fucking kill him. If if that's what you're gonna do, I mean the they fact they had to make they, they they had to make it so that they could get away with it, right? Yeah, but the news report is that he died in a car accident. Right. So what's the... there's no reason for this story with Harry called to happen at all, at all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so they say, okay, so this is what we'll do. We'll walk around talking about this one conversation. Well, they don't know exactly where or when Harry is listening to them. So they basically need to like start talking about this hotel conversation just all the fucking time, <laughs> you know? Right. Like, talk about it, talk about it in the morning, talk about it in the afternoon, talk about it at night, and plan for him to eventually get the fucking clue, which they're trying to plant in his head and get back to the director. So the idea that they could accomplish this just by, you know, one, just saying like, okay, well, just this one day... We'll go walk around the park and make it incredibly hard for anyone to get this conversation and even talk about the fact we know or suspect we're being surveilled, which is actually kind of a nice touch in a better movie. Right, right. You know, that they, that they, you know, she's, you know, she points out like, see that guy? He's got an earpiece. Like, I, I feel like we're being watched. That's, that's a nice touch on it, but it just, I don't know, have, 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 are we beating a dead horse now? Or do I think, think we're we've... beating a dead horse at this point. All right. All right. <laughs> I also don't like, and I got to give some minus five points to the fact that Harry call and the director don't have like a direct line to each other. Uh-huh. You know, either Harry doesn't know what he's looking for or he does either way. Like, you know, Oh, just call my receptionist and make an appointment kind of thing just doesn't seem to kind of fly and and we see the we see the reasons why in in this movie so i mean he does he does make the call he makes it from a payphone plus five points although i'm gonna dig in and complain about his claims that he doesn't have a a home phone when he actually does and he's really sloppy about how he uses it later but he's he's gonna take the tapes in Ford just wants to give him the payment and take the tapes. He doesn't like that. This is all reasons like why just in their initial meeting of with the director, like this should have been set up. This feels right. like this feels like private eye one oh one kind of stuff. <laughs> the movie's not clearly not as interested in intricacies of realistic and, and interesting and logical plots. As we are, so let's let's take a look at our main character Harry Call because this movie does. But before yeah, we yeah, get, yeah. let's 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 finish the plot out. That you know, after the conversation's planted and the directors get the tape, the director's plan is to go and confront the wife and possibly kill her, and maybe the boyfriend, 
and he gets there and I guess the boyfriend's hiding. So he's, he's playing the tape for her. And then I guess the boyfriend was hiding because he comes out from behind and puts like plastic over his head. And then they ended up just killing him. I don't know. Number one, I wanted to. I, oh, I, no, I no. That, mention- that was in Harry's head real quick, though. I mean, that's him visualizing what he thinks happened. I I think because one thing about this movie is we only ever see anything from Harry Call's perspective. The right. film never deviates to another character. Like, you know, Enemy of the State, we watched like what our bad guys were doing and we see what our good guys are doing. We see what other people are doing. You know, there's movies that have like a whole bunch of like perspectives and point of views. This movie's totally focused on Harry Call and not everything that's going on in his head can necessarily be trusted. But you're right. It does look like, I'm sorry. It does look like they murdered him in some kind of fashion like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so one, I wanted to point out my number one best tradecraft was planting the conversation. I thought that was really, really well thought out. But number three, if the director is planning on killing the boyfriend and confronting the wife, why didn't he bring other people? Why is he showing up alone? You know what I mean? Like this is probably going to get ugly and he's not like young and spry, like this, uh, upstart you know financial guy or whatever i would think he'd bring some like why isn't harrison ford at the hotel well oh yeah, harrison ford's on team ann and mark uh but why doesn't he have anybody else like his security guys at the hotel you know what i mean other than like maybe he has to keep it under wraps and he's gonna kill them yeah i mean a lot of this uh, a lot of the suspicions i have when i try to piece this together and make it make sense is that the director maybe for some of the things to make sense has to be like intensely, fiercely private about this situation. But he also has to be insanely wealthy. Uh, And that part, I mean, one of those can make sense, but then the other one has to make sense. And if the other one makes sense, then this is not a guy that like shows up at a hotel without, you know, somebody in his company knowing. And some of those somebodies are like, you know, guys with guns. Yeah, right. You know, like the bodyguard situation. This is security detail. Right. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's bad tradecraft on his part, for sure. We give him a little bit of a break because he's not a professional. Right. <laughs> and he's in a fit of rage. And he's in a fit of rage. Yep. But still, bad decisions are bad decisions. Absolutely. But, yeah, let's go talk about Harry. And his whole thing. Sure, because that's what, obviously, I mean, it feels like that's all the movie cares about, is Harry. Right. Um, right. Doesn't doesn't care about this plot stuff nearly as much as I would like it to. Is Harry Call actually good at his job? I think. I, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I would say yes. I just would expect him to be better at dealing with people or paying attention like when people were trying to screw him over. But, I mean, it seems like his job is tech and and getting surveillance from tech. And I think he's very good at it. But the fact that he's worked with people that are trying to get secrets from others, I would hope to know that, I would hope that he would be aware of how good uh, the human intelligence is and that he can't really, which is why he's so private, right? He refuses to tell anybody anything, but he makes a lot of bad mistakes and he should be aware of a lot of the tradecraft that human intelligence can use. And I would, I would like to hope he shouldn't have fallen for some things, you know, or at least he should have been more careful than he was pretending to be. Like, so I think he's good at his job. I just don't think he's very bright. Let's just put it that way. I agree. And I think, I mean, I think that's the, the point of the movie. I think it's intentional. I think he is, demonstrated to be very good at the technical side of things, but his understanding of people is very Absolutely. On the technical side, I mean, I think my best tradecraft, or at least, I mean, my favorite, because I don't really have a lot of best. I have a lot of, I have a lot of minus spy points and, and not a lot of pluses. There's not a lot of exciting about the tradecraft in this film, but I did really like watching him mix the audio from the four different sources. That was really fun. I call that my number one best. That is super fun. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, 
I don't know what the, he was doing, but he was obviously messing with the sound waves. And it goes again back to what I think is the superstar of this film is the is the sound mixing. But on all this, I mean, and you know, it he's at least making some moves to protect his privacy. Like the first call is is from a pay payphone booth. You know, he tells his girlfriend he doesn't have a landline. We're going to find out that's a lie. But, he, you know, he doesn't like the fact that people in his building know what his birthday is. Well, how did they find out? How how dumb do you have to be of a spy to have people that you don't know find out what your birthday is? Like, Dave, do you know what my birthday is? No, but I'm not a good example. Well, a lot of people know birthdays. I, I am not someone that remembers. Okay. Birthdays. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I don't fucking advertise or celebrate it. But I mean, it seems like keeping people in my apartment building from finding out what my birthday is should be not only easy, it should like almost require me to be actively stupid in order to fuck that up. Right. <laughs> Minus five points. <laughs> Especially the fact, you know, how paranoid he feels about it, you know, when he finds out that they do know. Like, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. Over there, back to that telephone that he has, he does have a landline, and I don't think he should. And the only two times he uses it, one time when he answers the phone, another when he makes a call from the phone, they're both idiotic. Absolutely. I don't know. Yeah, for someone that's this private as he is he does make a lot of mistakes and he kind of it doesn't add up (laughs) yeah he also really blows it by you know when he sees mark this is so this is the scene right after he's refused to give the tapes to Mm -hmm. martin out in the hallway he says sees mark Mm -hmm. in the hallway weird you know he didn't know this guy like worked at the company or would be in the same building and he stops right behind him, like just cold stops and, and looks at him so much so that it's so obvious that Mark, you know, who's in conversation with another guy, kind of looks over his shoulder and says, like, you know, hey, can I help you kind of in this situation? <laughs> he's becoming increasingly worried as he's gone through the tapes that this couple that he's surveilled are in trouble and that these tapes are dangerous and especially after the scene with Martin, like these things should be going in like a safe deposit box with like, you know, at a bank where he gives instructions that like only he or the director can retrieve them. Right. Something that like would that. be super helpful. You know, well, I guess the directions was to do it in person, but the fact that they're not in a place like that is weird. To be honest, I don't understand the whole point of the scene. I mean, this is more movie crafty, but the director obviously told Harry that he wants him to personally deliver them to him. Right. And he gets there, and there's Harrison Ford. Where where did this scene come from, and why did it happen? Because later on, it's obvious Harrison Ford wants the tapes to get to the director. So why is there a whole thing where Harry refuses to give it to him and why isn't the director present when the director specifically gave the... I feel like this whole scene was, like, useless. Other than to, like, maybe trick the audience or, like, make the audience creeped out or something. Exactly. Exactly. It does not suffer scrutiny at all. He's he's also, you know, the other angle of it is, to me, like, if he's becoming increasingly concerned about the safety of these people, which is established later in the film in what I think is a better part of the film that some people got killed once upon a time because of his surveillance. And he's kind of haunted by that. And there's a bunch of Catholic guilt that he has that's like layered into that. But pursuant to that, like when he makes his confession, you know, he confesses to a bunch of stuff, but not the stuff that's really weighing on his mind. Which, again, I think would be really cool in in a better film. But, like, the, the smart moves here... I mean, one smart move, I just throw it on the table. If you're worried about these people's safety, just warn them anonymously. Just make a phone call. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
I completely agree with you. you know, just just make a phone call. Refuse to say who you are or how you know, but just tell them like you're under you're under observation, and the director knows about your appointment. Which obviously, in the overarching, not since we know that they want the director to know about the meeting at the hotel, it wouldn't have changed anything. But still, that's just like simple stuff he could do. Uh, mm -hmm. Other simple stuff he could do. He could fucking find out more about who these people are. Yeah. He's got that one guy that could easily be uh, confused for Gary Oldman. You know the guy I'm talking about? It's one of his four guys in the initial conversation recording. He's one of the guys that had the Christmas package. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I did quick double check. It wasn't Gary Oldman, but it's not. Right. But it could right. it could have been. You know, that guy's got police contacts. That guy can run plates. That guy is like, you know, the best tailman in the business. Clearly doesn't have, you know, clearly it seems like they're friends. Clearly seems like Harry doesn't have any qualms in working with him. Put that guy on the case. Say like, hey, yeah. who are these people? <laughs> right. You know, uh, you know, let's let's. Let's gather some intelligence. Instead of gathering intelligence, what he does is he goes to the hotel and gets a room next door to the room where the shit's going to go down and wants to listen in on it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, slight plus five points for flushing the toilet when he's drilling the little hole. And, you yeah. know, it's kind of cool. He's got this these techniques. But once again, he's relying entirely on wiretapping and is exhibiting no sense or no thought whatsoever about like again human intelligence that he could easily have access to right exactly that's my number um, two worst tradecraft right there i did like his little kit though oh, what? oh i loved his little kit i loved yeah. it yeah <laughs> And I liked how the, he drilled in the hole. Like, yeah, the cover of the flushing the toilet was really cool. But yeah, you're right. There was so many other ways that he could go through this that he didn't take advantage of. Here's another one. Pursuant to the same thing. So now, even even though he's, you know, done all these, in my mind, like just walked past all these obvious moves to find out what's going on. He's in the adjacent room. He's hearing the argument. Mm -hmm. I know 911 wasn't a thing yet. But there are fucking telephones in hotel rooms and you can call the police or you can call the front desk and you can say there's an altercation in the room next door. I was thinking the exact same thing. Anything like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, yeah, that was really annoying. The whole time I was like, call somebody. All he does is hide in his bed and turn the Flintstones up. <laughs> right well i mean and maybe this circles around to why some critics do like this film is because harry's so flawed in this way that you know and maybe that's like what we're supposed to get from his catholicism and his secret shame that he that he is ashamed of what he does and that's why he doesn't reach out you know or talk to people or admit what he does or oh, or, or want yeah. to know anything about it Right, but he really should he really should be in a different field of work. This is Absolutely. not this is not the field of work he should be in as as a person. He might yeah, have the definitely. skills, you know. He should be he should be the the tech guy on the team, not the leader of the team. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I think we got. Uh, I mean, then we got uh, you know freak out in his head, toilet blood, which is just fucking weird. As fuck. This came out before The Shining, though. I had to check on that. Yeah, um, the, the the toilet blood thing was really weird. It went from, like, a realistic kind of artsy film to all of a sudden being, like, a weird metaphorical type of, like, the, 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 the blood toilet didn't make any sense. Like, this wasn't, like, a mindfuck type film. And then you have this weird mindfuck moment. And it really bothered me. Yeah, it felt out of place the whole time. And I'm like, okay, well, can we get back to the movie? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Same same here, because, I mean, you and me would probably both agree that that's only happening in his mind, right? Mm-hmm. 
The, well, um, the toilet blood for sure. Okay. Um, I think so, he did witness what he thought was her being murdered, and it turned out to be the director. Right. So I'm I'm totally cool. In fact, I'm super cool with, and I think it's one of the strengths of the movies of the movie, as I've said before, of this idea that you know he's having like audio hallucinations, or that what's going on in his head in his head of remembering like what the voices are telling him or what he's hearing in there could be like flawed or messed up. But as soon as it turned visual with the toilet, I, I really got turned off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just, yeah, it was just like, ah. so I don't exactly know where the convention part of the film fits in. We've, we've kind of skipped ahead to the hotel. I think the convention ha- has to have happened before the hotel. But the convention is my favorite part of the film. Let's see. His quote-unquote rival kind of guy, the short, oily guy, is, is one of the best performances in the film. I absolutely loved the entire convention scene from beginning to end. And I thought if this had just been like a short film, you know, just focusing on this, I think it would have been great. How did, how did, how did you like it? I really liked it. I I liked it, especially it, it it had a place in the film where like Harry's part of this community, because you know like you had mentioned the whole film is about Harry's alienation from other people and how it affects him and stuff. And this is like another place where he has an opportunity to like be personable, you know and. It's a convention and you already know who your competitors are and you know who people you like your vendors and some of your clients and stuff. You go to these conventions and you rub elbows and you get drinks and then you go have parties and stuff. And I I really like that they set up, hey, there's a real world that Harry belongs to and he still alienates himself. These are people that would understand him, but he just he I guess he feels like above them or something or I, I don't know. He's. He's just super panicky. So, like, I really liked this whole setup. And it was a nice little mini story with Harrison Ford kind of following him, too. I'm not following you. I'm looking for you. There's a difference. That yeah, is a really, that was that's, pretty- a, that's a really good line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a really good line. You know, there's a phone freaking demonstration that I liked. I liked, I liked dude's little, like elaborate like i'm gonna call my i'm right now in front of you all i'm gonna call my wife and like you know fakes that you know she's with another guy and like Uh i i liked you know in a film where i struggle to find like best tradecraft there's a moment where you know he pretends to be interested in a certain piece of surveillance equipment and surreptitiously uses that to kind of see around the room without looking like he's seeing around the room. That's how he spots the Harrison Ford character. That's my best number two right there. Yeah, that was really cool. I I liked uh, his competitor hands him a pen, which later we find out was a mic that... So I don't know that this tech would have been out and maybe Harry was unaware of it, but yeah, the competitor's here, take a pen, take a pen. And it's actually like a recording device. So that made my best number three trade craft was planting the pen. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. In any later film, I feel like I really would have like had alarm bell ringing on Harry call, you know, being paranoid about being surveilled, accepting anything, you know, like a pen or, or (laughs) anything like that. But it does, it does seem to me like at the time, you know, a microphone that small might have been like news even to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he, when he pulls it out, he was really surprised. So, so it, 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 that had to have been like cutting edge technology at the time of this film would be my yeah, guess. But if also, but you know, if it is cutting edge technology, why isn't that like front and center in this guy's booth? You know, and, <laughs> yeah, and he should be advertising it and showing it off. Well, I think he said, "Hey, with you and me together, we could make up all kinds of stuff to sell to the fans, and we would still have the best surveillance." So he might have been hiding that, you know, because at a convention, there's a lot of people that are there to get information, and you probably don't want to put your best foot forward, 
You know what I mean? Because the that that greasy guy that's his competitor stole an idea from someone else that Harry knew, right? So he probably knows the value of putting shit out there. So he wouldn't want to put the pen out there. He would want people to hire his company to do surveillance. Meanwhile, he's got like this lesser junk that he can hire, uh, you know, sell to people that aren't as good as him. Would be my guess. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. I mean, it's it's got to be it's got to be weird deciding exactly what you're going to showcase, right? And at what point? Because everything here, like you know, just by showcasing it, it's diminishing value. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a very weird kind of product surveillance yeah, equipment in in that way. What I really liked about the convention is really showing that he has all these opportunities to have relationships and learn how to like interact with people. If you've ever been to any kind of convention, I don't care if it's a work convention, I don't care if it's a fan convention, there's always after parties. There's always like, hey, let's go out and get drunk and be act a fool. Meanwhile, I mean, the plan here, though, is for that greasy guy to get information out of Harry, like, because he really sees Harry as the best surveiller. He keeps bringing up this old story. But other than that, it's just a bunch of people trying to get drunk and have a good time. And... Number one, why are they going to his like you know secret lab? I I don't like this. He's he. This is the guy that likes pushing people away. I mean, he also likes some of the acknowledgement because they start talking about one of his good jobs. So he kind of does like the recognition, but for the most part, he's to himself. So why is he bringing people there, right? And. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't clock for me. But anyway, there's a whole party. People are getting drunk, and there's this girl hitting on him the whole time, and she's like really hitting on him the whole time. It's like obvious she's hitting on him, and it's not like for any good reason. You know what I mean? It's not like she. She kind of seems like she's just like a bored wife or something. But it's obvious she's just trying to fuck him, right? And it, it kind of felt weird. And then when you find out later that she stole the tapes of the conversation. It makes more sense why she's overwhelmingly on his dick. You know what I mean? Usually, like, at a night like this, if even if she's trying to get laid that night, she's going to, like, talk to a bunch of people and figure out who she would want to get with. And you got to, like, kind of play back and forth with her. She's not going to just jump on you like this. You know what I mean? Especially not for Harry, right? So, one, why is he bringing people over to his little, like, you know, hidden secret lair and number two why aren't the tapes hidden or locked up somewhere you know i i don't i didn't like he knows how valuable these tapes are they're worth fifteen thousand dollars at the very least he knows this is probably gonna make he, he figured out this is gonna make or break someone's life or death why are the tapes just sitting around that really bothers me but i did want to mark my number two best trade craft was the director or no Harrison Ford using Meredith to sleep with Harry to get the tapes. I definitely like that. Yeah, I'll call that my best number three. Although, as with a lot of this movie, I, I really can't quite connect the dots on how uh, it was arranged. And then even when I start to strain to connect the dots, I go back to my main point of, I don't understand how, if they're so much better at this shit than he is, you know, why, why, why they needed him in the first place. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, they could have just gone to a place and had Harrison Ford's guys record them and then give those to the director and said, these are the tapes he gave us and we yeah. gave him his 15,000. Boom. Done yeah. and done and done. All these rivers are feeding into this one Delta of the plot sucks. And <laughs> at the end, you know, they faked this hotel killing into a car accident as being the cause of death. So we could just go right back to the to the headwaters where the uh-huh. river started and just fucking kill him and say it was a car accident <laughs> and you're fucking done. <laughs> yeah. You didn't need this whole story. Yeah. This movie didn't need to happen. No. And yeah, that really pissed me off with the, the newspaper. Like... You would think the autopsy would show the stab wounds, right? I mean, I, know I would they think. Mentioned, yeah, right. I know they mentioned that the, the detectives thought there was foul play, but what was the, yeah, there was no point in the car accident. I don't know, whatever. 
I think I think I think you and I both feel the same about this film that it didn't need to be made, and there was a lot of a lot of a lot of weird situations that didn't really add up. Yeah, let's just let's just run for that debriefing room and land this plane. Agents, please report for debriefing on this operation. The director will see you now. Uh, it'll be no surprise that I'm going super low with this one. I'm going with a one point. Five. Yeah. For context, I want to mention like movies that I've given a lower rating to. There's only one. It's Spy Kids. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't need to see Spy Kids. If you if you put me under torture and said like you have two choices, you can see Spy Kids or you can see the conversation. I would say I'll watch the conversation again. You can keep your Spy Kids. <laughs> and and this will join this will join my only other 1.5 with uh spies like us but sincerely if i could if i could and i'm not going to if i could squeak it in this is slightly above spies like us but not by much because at least this film i'm told that there's more to it that i'm not seeing and I believe it. I believe that this movie quite possibly has something that it's trying to say to me. It's just talking in a language that I don't understand. Right. <laughs> so if I had to rewatch one of those three films, it would be this one. But uh, everything else we've reviewed on this on this podcast is higher than this for me. Did not like it. I, I like your reasoning. I was going to give this a 1.5, but I think I would rather watch this than Spies Like Us. And I put Spies like, Spy Kids at 1.5, and I think I'm, Our Man Flint was a 2 for me. So would I watch Our Man Flint over this? Probably not, but I did think it was a funner movie than this. So yeah. I, I more, think enjoy we'll more enjoyable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely more enjoyable. So I'm, I'm going with a 1.5 on this as well. It just really bothered me watching the whole time all these little things that just like are obvious, like why he didn't call the police, why he went to the hotel by himself. And then what was the point of this whole movie? You know, they didn't need Harry, which I think we've said a number of times. And there are better ways to lure the director out to kill him. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. So, yeah, now I'm with you. 1.5. My best number three is also going to be your best number two. Um, using Meredith to get the tapes. I mean, it's it's good because we know as the audience that Harry can't fucking spot an obvious honey trap kind of situation <laughs> right. on his best day because it's just bad with people. Uh, right. So that's a good angle to go after him with. Yeah, number three best. Number two, I did like at the convention, you know, when he used the test products to see what's going on around him. Like, that's like one of the glimmers of cleverness that I saw in the film. My number one best part of this film was the sound and the different, like, layers of of the conversation and the way it affects his mind. But But just on a technical aspect... Like, I just enjoyed watching him do his little stuff with all his mechanical tape stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> Very analog. And I'm a yeah. huge, I love analog. I yeah, love yeah. clicky. <laughs> I love clicky buttons and, and tape and reels and stuff. Digital yeah. can fuck off. My number three best tradecraft was the competitor placing the pen, which was a mic. Especially for that time, that would have been kind of cutting edge. My number two best tradecraft was using Meredith to sleep with Harry to get the tapes. And then my number one best tradecraft was planting the conversation. I know the whole thing was like a waste of time. It was unnecessary. But given that it was necessary, let's pretend it was. I think the the way it was executed was the, the very well done. So that made my number one best tradecraft. I wanna I wanna support you. I wanna I wanna throw some support there. In a better more well thought out film like the way mm -hmm. they do it is really cool it's mm -hmm. just when you think about it there's no reason for them to need to do it that fucking right. cool <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah I'll, I'll 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 support i'll support a number one there 
over on worst, I had a I had a much richer field to dig through. Letting people into the station, this is you're gonna mirror this one, but this is my number yeah. three worst. Letting the uh, convention after party occur at his secret lair. I mean, you could do that, but at the minimum, put those fucking tapes away, which you should right. have put away <laughs> even before this situation even evolved. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. My number two worst is that he's so concerned about these people and he makes no moves whatsoever to investigate or find out what's going on in a human intelligence kind of capacity, which he does have access to. My number one worst, again, this is the delta into which all rivers flow. I'm just going to call it number one, the plot. (laughs) That's my worst tradecraft of the film. Yeah, nice. My number three worst trade craft was the director going to the hotel alone. I, I would think he would have a posse or something. My number two worst trade craft was what was the point of recording the conversation when you had Harrison Ford, who clearly was much more intelligent and capable than Harry in in human intelligence. Number one worst trade craft was letting people into his little secret lab and put the fucking tapes away. Just put them in a shoebox. Hide them under your mattress. I don't know. Mail them to yourself so that I, I don't know. Dude, just don't don't leave them out and start playing them in front of the chick you're fucking, you know, and just leave them there while you pass out. I, I, I call it bullshit. That's gonna inform, of course, our park bench rating, which is separate from our star rating. This is just our rating from one to five park benches about how much we appreciate it or think is accurate. Of the tradecraft in the film before we start i am going to mention we did see some park bench action in this film of course one of it was just uh, Anne commenting on you know this bum just dying <laughs> on a park bench <laughs> and being sad about it so i i guess i mean that's it is a park bench but but actually during the the recording of the conversation people do not in the terms we usually think of like a park bench meeting. That's usually like when you and me are like sitting next to each other, pretending not to know each other. But, you know, oh. Harry does, you know, sit down and, and pretend to just be like relaxing a little bit. Let the couple move around a bit, you know, before he gets up. So, yeah, park bench is always a great ingredient in any great spy movie. But what's our rating here? Well, the tech is pretty legit, you know. But Harry's kind of an idiot, so I kind of want to start at a three and and work our way down or up. Like, do you think this deserves more than a three? I I wouldn't really say it deserves more than a three. I'm feeling a 2.5. That would also put us in a company with the man who knew too much, both of them, mm-hmm. from Russia with love mm-hmm. and enemy of the state which uh, is is comparable for different reasons. Enemy right. of the State, again, fantastic at the time, but we found out by now, like, that shit exists. 2.5. I like 2.5. 2. Let's 5. go 2.5. Park benches for the conversation. 1974 movie that uh, David and I, if you haven't seen it, don't bother. <laughs> right, I completely agree. If you have seen it and you think that we called this completely wrong, how would people tell us that we're idiots, Dave? They can go to spieslikeus.net and go to our contact page and send us an email. Or you can also message us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com spies like us podcast. Or you can find us on Twitter, spies underscore like us. And we'll be happy to chat with you and go back and forth on what you what you thought about it. More than happy. More than uh, happy. Absolutely. I I always like to say, you know, those things are great and I would love that engagement. We're absolutely hungry for it. But uh the number one best thing you can ever do to support an independent podcast just done by two guys in a little apartment with no money is just tell a friend. Yes. And if you can arrange to tell a friend at a park bench, bonus five points for you. 
And if you <laughs> hate this podcast, please tell one of your enemies that they would love it. And then just <laughs> chuckle and glee and rub your hands together when you can imagine their disappointment. What's coming up next? This is uh, this was our movie episode for the month. We're doing uh, TV next for the next three weeks. What do we got on the slate, Dave? Turn. It's about Washington spies, the spy ring the, that George Washington had going on during the Revolutionary War. There was a TV show made about it, and we're pretty excited to jump on this one. I've watched the entire show, and Todd just started watching it, and so we're very excited for this. I just started watching it. I'm only two episodes in. Of course, the pilot is uh, 90 minutes long, so when I say I'm two episodes in, I'm really like two hours in. Right. And, uh, <laughs> I am hard as a rock for this show. This is absolutely totally in my wheelhouse. I'm super excited to talk about the trade craft here because this show is drenched in really good trade craft. A lot of ins and outs, a lot of what have yous, a lot of wondering who knows what and what is truth and what is lies. It is fucking brilliant out of the gate. I hope it keeps this pace through the thing. And I am as excited as I've like this. This is peak excitement for me yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to, to talk about this show. So we'll join you next week for that. It's uh it's available. It's an AMC original. It is currently available on Netflix. So uh, if you have not seen it, you know, and you're like on the fence on whether you want to check it out or not. Our first episode will be spoiler free. So it might be a good introduction for you to find out if you or make that decision on whether you want to make that commitment to watch the show. If you have watched the show, then please look forward to checking out what our commentary on it is. Absolutely. And then looming on the horizon after we do three weeks of, of uh, talking about turn, but we're going to finally get to a version of the spy genre that I think has been suspiciously missing from our coverage for two years. Now we're finally going to get to it. And I think we have a great example of the world war two behind enemy lines kind of movie. And uh, for that, I've I've looked at uh, some different options, and I'm landing on Where Eagles Dare. I haven't seen it yet, but based on the plot synopsis, I think it is exactly uh, the kind of movie that epitomizes that uh, that kind of thing, that inglorious bastards, that Force Ten from Navarone kind of thing. That would be really fun to talk about. And I'm really oh, yeah. excited about that. So I got two. Well, and then Libero. So I'm I'm excited. It's turtles all the way down. Hey Moira, initiate protocol nine. Protocol nine initiated. This podcast will self-destruct in twenty seconds. The preceding transmission sampled the songs "Ice Cold" by Audio Nautics. Enter the party by Kevin McLeod and sound effects from Freesound.org. Attributions and links are found at spieslikeus.net. Editing by Todd Hostetler.